Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prague Sea. We've got part two of our look at some pretty notable albums from some pretty notable bands. Are they criminally underrated? Are they misunderstood? Or do these albums just plain suck? These are albums that often get talked about by the fan base, by the critics as kind of weird ones in these bands catalogs. Some people love them. Some people don't. We're going to talk about what we think about these. Are they misunderstood? Are they underrated? Or do these just kind of suck, right? So let's introduce the cast. We've got uh, Eric Porter, my fellow New Yorker. That kind of rhymes. Pretty cool. We've got Chad Hutchinson, Mr. Nearfest himself. We got our center square all the way from Scotland, Stephen Reed, one half of, actually one third of the UK connection. No, actually, no, he is half of the UK connection. I'm just a bystander on those shows. <laughs> We've got all the way up from Canada, John Newdorf. We've got the professor of Prague from the Laser's Edge, Ken Golden, and from Chicago, Louis Nasser. Greetings, everyone. Hey. 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 All right, so the four albums in question today, again, uh, we've been picking kind of the bigger bands and all the bigger bands do have an album, in some cases, more than one album, where kind of a weird one in their catalog, right? So uh, for Genesis, we've got, and then there were three. For Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, we've got Black Moon. For Jethro Tull, we have Rock Island. And for Pink Floyd, we have The Final Cut. Let's start off with uh, Genesis, shall we? So, and then there were three. I think most people know the history here. First album, post Hackett leaving. They're now their third studio album with Phil Collins' lead vocals. So now they're just a trio. We got Mr. Rutherford doing all guitar duties. This is the album that still sort of has a foot in the prog camp, but you can hear their sound getting much more poppy and accessible, which they would continue on with Duke. All right, and then starting into the 80s, we're pretty much all in basically Popville for them. So, uh, but some people still really like this album a lot. Some people don't at all. So is it currently underrated? Is it misunderstood or is this a stinker? So we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna go Eric, Chad, Steven, John, Lewis, Ken, myself, and we'll go around on each one of these albums. Everybody give their feedback. So uh, Eric, what do you think about, and then there were three. Should have been called, and then there were none, right? Or should it have stayed, and then there were four, probably, right? Well, good evening, gentlemen. Um, and then there were three. This is an album that I probably shouldn't like because I'm a huge Steve Hackett fan. Um, and I think you have to look at Genesis in terms of they lost Gabriel pretty much on the heels of that. You got two more albums, Hackett's gone. There's going to be a big change. And I think they, <clears throat> the recovery they made, or maybe that's the wrong word, Trick of the Tail is my favorite Genesis album. I love Gabriel. I don't have a problem with the Gabriel era, but, era, but I love it. Um, for And then there were three. To me, I think there's a lot of really good tracks on this. I guess I kind of feel it's underrated because I do feel like this is kind of the album people start talking about the slide. Maybe it's a little further down. There's a lot of love for Duke. Abacab kind of gets so-so. But I think there's some great songs. The opener, Down and Out, is fantastic. I love Deep in the Mother Load, Lady Lies. I like some of the softies. I love Snowbound. Um, I do think you hear, I, I don't want to say struggling, but I feel like Rutherford in, in a way is sometimes trying to create what Hackett did that I kind of think fails a bit. A lot of his um, solos sound stiff on this album to me, or, you know, they're, they're very simple. The one thing I don't care about this, and I don't know a lot about this stuff because I think trick of the tail and wind and Wuthering are really great sounding albums. I don't like the production of this. And I don't know what that, I don't like Rutherford's guitar sound, um, but there's something else to this album to me that there's just, it just sounds, I don't even know the word I'm looking for. I don't, I don't like the production, I guess, of this, but I think there's some really strong songs. I don't have an issue with Follow You, Follow Me. It's a decent song. Is it what you would expect of Genesis a few years prior? No, um, but for some reason, I like it. So I, I think it's, it's a fairly strong record and, cons and considering 
what they went through, where they were at this point. I, I don't think it's a stinker. I do think it's a bit underrated by the fan base. Um, you know, and I think they followed it up with Duke. Duke's another really good one, I think. Um, so for me, I, I kind of give them a little more leeway after this. I even go into Abacab a bit before I really start losing interest. But for me, this is underrated. Cool. Chad. Um, I'm going to agree with most of what, what Eric said on, on then there were three. Uh, the first two tracks are very strong. They, I think they come off of trick, trick of the tail well. Um, I'm not as, I mean, Ballad of Big and Snowbound haven't aged as well with me. They're okay. Um, I think the, the, the Snowman lyrics are a little cheesy. Um, having them sing about uh, um, uh, basically a cowboy and Ballad of Big is a little odd. It's okay. It's kind of an interesting, it's kind of a fun story, but Again, I don't think it aged that well. Deep in the Mother Load's a great song. I always really like the middle of that when they come right back into the uh, Go West Young Man. And, and as much as Rutherford's not a great guitar player, that slide he does right before they come back in always gets me. Always love that. Um, if you're going to have a ballad on this album, if you could only have one, and I wish they only had one, Many to Many is the one. That's a really great song. Uh, it's completely different than Follow You, Follow Me, which I think really almost feels tacked on to the end of this album. Um, Lady Lies is good. Scenes from a nice stream is okay. Uh, and Say It's All Right, Joe. Say It's All Right, Joe just flat out sucks. That shouldn't be on the album at all. That album, that song is absolutely terrible. Um, I would agree. I, just, I would call it underrated. Uh, being, this is a, we talked, you guys talked about transition albums last week. This is a major transition. Uh, with Hackett leaving, it really misses that romanticism that he brought. There's a, a little bit at the beginning of the album, and then it kind of fades off, and you you see where they might go. Though I will say, Duke is a much more refined and mature album than this one. This, as a whole, feels like a little bit of a stumble, trying to figure out where they want to go. But um, I still like the album a lot, minus a few songs. So I will agree with Eric and say underrated. Cool. I don't, I don't understand why people seem to like, like Chad just said, why people seem to prefer Duke over this album. I think it's brighter. I think there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of big themes on it. You know, I don't want to get into Duke, but turn it on again and behind the lines and things like that. Uh, Man of our times. They're just big, powerful type songs, even though they're a little poppier. I think they stick in your head a little better than some of the things on, on in the, in the I just, number three. I just hated that damn drum machine. That's true. That well, I understand. I get you. That drove me crazy. Yeah. Hey, you got a, a few more albums too. I was not, that was a treat. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, Duke sweet as a, as a piece was, a, was a nice piece, but yeah, the production on that record kind of, kind of bugged me. All right, Chad, welcome back after a couple of weeks. Stephen, welcome back after, well, Stephen, Stephen uh, showed his face for like about 30 seconds last, last week's show before the, the internet problems. And John, welcome back after a couple of weeks. So, all right, Stephen, uh, our center square, your opinions on, uh, and then there were three. It's an interesting album because I think hindsight, because of Follow You, Follow Me, drags this album into an era that it doesn't really come from. That's a massive pop hit and it is a great pop tune, but that's what it is. It's not really indicative of this album. It's indicative of what happens two or three albums down the line. At the time, I would guess this was maybe just a change too far or a change too many in terms of lineup. Because people, you know, we've lost Gabriel, so you've already got people kind of going, oh, well, what's this band all about? I've kind of lost one of the main focal points. Then obviously when Hackett goes, I mean, uh, how many bands can lose a charismatic lead singer and a phenomenal lead guitarist and arguably become bigger? There can't be many of those, you know? Um, so I think it probably got misunderstood at the time because people had really kind of put that to the one side and said, well, this can't be Genesis now. And there are elements on this album that really kind of bear that through as well, I think. However, this and Duke 
I think, are misunderstood, maybe less so now than they were a few years ago. And Duke, as Ken alludes to, seems to get an easier ride out of the two. I like them pretty even, I would suggest. And I do think that Follow You, Follow Me colours an awful lot of opinions on this album more than anything else. But you do have, I like The Lady Lies, I think it's still reasonably progressive. I think Many Too Many is really good, Undertow is really good. I think some of the compositions are really quite tight and really quite interesting. And by this stage, I mean, it was natural that Genesis, all bands after this length of time would evolve into something slightly different. And we all know that the times were a changing. So bands couldn't afford to stand still <clears throat> if they were going to stay relevant. The relevance to us kind of starts to peel away here because what became relevant wasn't really what people like us were wanting to hear. But realistically, there was an awful lot of pressure on bands to do something. And that's something that was born through in a lot of the, the interesting conversation that came out of last week's show, is that the pressures were on bands to do something different. I think for Genesis at this stage, it was natural that they did something different because the lineup is vastly different now. So, yeah, it's an interesting album in that sense because I think it's misunderstood and therefore underrated. I understand why, though, but I really quite like it. I can live with this either at Genesis, no problem at all. So to me, it's underrated or misunderstood, whichever way you want to look at it, and, and that's where I come, come from with this album. Cool. John? Uh, yeah, for me, um, I think this is the album that they, you know, they had to make at the time, as everyone's alluded to all the changes that were going on uh, and, you know, losing two incredibly talented people. How can we expect, you know, Supper's Ready or what have you? So I think it's the album they had to make. And I think there's, I mean, it's a really lush sounding album. I actually really like it. And and I don't think, um, you know, Follow, Follow You, Follow Me defines the album at all. But I happen to like that song because I kind of like a sappy ballad or two, right? I just, it hooks me. But there's some really nice songs in here. Snowbound, I really like. Deep in the Mother Load is an excellent song. Um, Undertow is a nice tune. Uh, the Lady Lies is another good one. Uh, many Too Many is a really, as I said earlier, is a really nice ballad. So I just think uh, it was really tough to, it must have been really hard to make this album without Hackett. And you know, I think Rutherford does a pretty admirable job. I, you know, he's got some pretty, pretty cool rhythm, rhythm that things happening. I mean, he's not so much a soloist, but I think it all works in the big scheme of things. And, you know, it's a good album, um, probably as far as you know, Genesis is concerned. So I give it a thumbs up. Okay. Lewis. Um, I, I'm going to disagree with Stephen. I don't think the album is misunderstood. I think the reason the Genesis is because they understood it and they didn't like the change in direction. It's, okay. um, you know, first of all, let's just be clear. Um, I, I respect Mike Rutherford, but he's no guitar player. And if you have a guy like Daryl Strummer in the wings, let him play. This is just stupid beyond description, frankly. Okay. We can, we can make excuses, whatever, egos, seniority. It doesn't matter. You have a guy who's a guitarist and you have a brilliant bass player pretending to play guitar. Already that's going to make it inferior, right? Because it, it, they appear to be similar. They're really not. And if you want to understand the difference, ask a guitar player to play bass. It's not pretty. So it's, 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 it's one of those things, right? There is a specialty to each instrument. And, and um, Steve Hackett's shoes are huge. It's not just any old guitarist, right? So, I mean, whereas Phil Collins turned out to be a fantastic singer by some stroke of great luck and a really good songwriter too, uh, Mike Rutherford does not hold a candle up to Steve Hackett. So as a, from one of the biggest strengths of Genesis, which was the instrumental section, suffer greatly across the board. 
as soon as Haikit is gone. And then on top of that, there is, as everybody's commented, a very overt desire to change the format of the band. So in other words, what Genesis are doing is they're, they're trying to, to get a new fan base. And they were very successful at it. And I think that is very commendable because they could have crashed and burned so hard, right? They made it work. They had Phil and um, Phil had it in him. So they just followed him through. And I kudos to them because that, that really made them a huge band. Whereas in the late seventies, they weren't as big as they ever became in the early nineties, right? They were just enormous at that time. So whether, but again, I tend to be of the opinion that commercial success does not equate to creative success, right? It's the same thing as with McDonald's. Nobody sells more burgers, but we can all agree they're not the best. And, and I think that um, that is one thing that I don't want to overvalue. The fact that they sold a lot of records doesn't necessarily mean that the people who follow them up to that point were going to like that new brand. Right? I've often thought maybe it would have been good if they had changed their name because they were deliberately trying to change their sound. And I think that had they changed their name, then people would have said, you know, they still have a Genesis flavor, but they're doing something different. And maybe that wouldn't have alienated the fans so much. They would just want the Genesis back, but they would have given it a, a, a fairer chance. But when you put the label Genesis on the front of the record and you're deliberately trying not to sound like Genesis in some cases, right? That's a problem. And um, so, so in that sense, I, I would disagree. I don't think it's misunderstood. Uh, on, on the other hand, I, I do think it has the effect that we talked about last week. Are people listening to the record that they have in front of them and reacting to that? Or are they pissed off that they're not hearing what they wanted to hear? Right? So if you, if you just look at, at what they did, I think the record has got lots of fairly good to, to, to quite good songs. And only, a, only two that I would, that I personally, I don't like ballads in general. And that way I, I tend to go with George Softies. You know, it's a fine line and it's a different line for everybody, right? Where you land in the, on, the, on that line, that's, that's entirely subjective. Uh, to me, they, I, they always land on the wrong side for me. So I don't like follow you, follow me. Um, I don't like Snowbound. I, I don't like those songs. But uh, the album has some great stuff. It has some really good drum playing by Phil Collins and some really, really good keyboard work from Tony Banks. And Mike Rutherford is always great on bass. I mean, like I said, you know, this guy invented a lot of these prog rock tropes, right? So you got to respect the man, you know? Just don't play the guitar, Mike. Not the electric six string guitar, please. Do your arpeggios, do your 12 string stuff. That sounds beautiful. Don't do the other stuff. It's just not your thing, you know? And um, so for me, I don't think it's, I think it's underrated, but only because people are not, not, it's underrated by Genesis fans because it's not really the Genesis they like. And the, and the new generation of fans are not satisfied because it's not poppy enough. So it's a half-assed mm. effort in both directions. That's what I meant by misunderstood. Yeah, but but I think I think that um, uh, you know the the I reality. Think the band understood that, what they were doing. But I yeah, don't think I mean, I, I think that they were too shy. They should have just gone for it. But they had they it, it, and it's difficult. It's easy for me to say, right? But but um, I I just think that the the fans that they made later, like the people who love Invisible Touch, are not going to reach for this one. And neither are many of the people, there are more people who will love, you know, Foxtrot, who will listen to this and, and force themselves to extract all the good stuff because it's buried in there, right? That's, that, I, I, this is, so I would say this is a little bit more toward the proggy part of their career, but it's already letting you know that there's a big change coming, right? And they're moving in that direction. And I think that for that reason, it's, it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's, it's right. It's, it's, it's can't right please everybody. 
Yeah. Yeah, in a way it is. And, and, um, That's what it is. It's evolution. You, you, it you're never going to go straight from trick of the tail to invisible touch. And I'm That's sure. I don't care what band it is. That's not going to happen. No. There must be some... they, they, I agree. I'm not. I'm not telling. I, I am nobody to tell Genesis how to do their <laughs> record. I'm just saying that for me as a fan and as a musician and as, as somebody who loves music dearly uh, and who loved the old Genesis and especially who loves Steve Hackett as a musician and admire him deeply, right? I'm not gonna say it's offensive that they thought they could replace him with Mike Rutherford because people choose to be offended. This is bullshit as far as I'm concerned. I'm not offended, but, but I do think it's silly. And um, because especially they had the great player in the wings, right? Uh, but Luis, Luis, you, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You're, you're actually kind of changing the timeline because there was a conscious decision to have to not replace Hackett. It, you know, they, uh, they wanted Brotherford to play the guitar on the album. Sturmer came, Sturmer, Sturmer came, well, it was a bad decision, as I've said in the past. But Sturmer came much later. In okay, fact, well, Al Alfonso Johnson was brought in. Yeah, and, he recommended him, right? Right. Yeah. And, right. And then Gary Moore was offered the, the position and he turned it down. I heard from somebody else, somebody else many years ago told me that Royal Brighton was suggested, but that may be just total bullshit. Right. They came to Sturmer. Sturmer came well after the album was recorded. I see. So, so now, okay. if, if we were talking about if we were talking about Duke, then the question becomes: Why the hell isn't Sturmer playing on Duke? Why isn't he playing on Invisible Touch and everything else? You know, and why isn't Phil playing the drums? I, I yeah. agree with that. Right? <clears throat> yeah, but, but I just yeah. In yeah. fact, in fact, if I and I'm doing this from memory, I'm an old man. If I remember correctly, and somebody will, I'm sure, will correct me in the comments. I think that Rutherford was playing guitar synthesizer on that album. I vaguely remember that that he was playing a guitar synthesizer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he, you know, clearly he doesn't have the chops. He just no. doesn't. Stephen, I don't even think it says it, but I remember. Uh, yes, like, oh, it's the you're right. right. You're right. On uh, looks like the end of Ballad of Big. Yeah. The end of the track has Banks and Rutherford. Banks, Banks, Banks played the guitar synthesizer, right? Well, I don't. I remember. You know, yeah. I saw them in '78, and, yeah, and I remember Rutherford before. playing a guitar synthesizer. Well, so, maybe, maybe live in the studio. I think it was, both, it was thanks to in both parts. It could be the, uh, but yeah, but you know, they 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 clearly decided when Hackett left, we're not replacing that guy. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna deal with it internally. So well, they felt because they were the like the rhythms. The three of them were like the rhythm section for you know Apocalypse and Nine Eight and some other things that they could pull it off. So they went with it. They wanted to stick you to know it. What? I'm not taking anything away from their talents as musicians, right? But no, of course not. but you do have to respect the the craft and the thousands of hours that it takes to master a specific instrument, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's just a fact. Um, playing bass doesn't mean you know how to play guitar and vice versa, even though they share four strings and they're, you know, it's not the same thing. They have a different function, right? The, it's it's an entirely different role, and and I think that um that was the first thing that surprised me when I heard it. The the absence of Hackett was much more noticeable than the absence of Phil Collins. When you hear Trick of the Tail and you know Wind and Withering, those are great records. I don't I don't miss Peter Gabriel. Objectively, I don't. You know, I they're great great records. This one is the first time when I, I felt like, all right, there's a big hole here and nobody's filling those shoes. And it is, it is a transitionary album. It is all these things that have been said. For me, I, don't, I would never say that it sucks. I, 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 I enjoy most of it, but, but it is a strange experience to listen to it. it, it, it it's the first time I heard a Genesis record that, that frustrated me. Because I, 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 it was it was lacking one of his greatest strengths, you know, which was packet, plain and simple, you know. All right, Ken, you're too. Well, I, th I think people are going to expect me to trash this album, but uh, I have a lot of nostalgia with this album. So uh, if I could take just a, a quick trip down memory lane, 
I first I saw them in 78. They played at Rockland Community College. I think I mentioned that in the past. And they played on April 1st, 1978. And then I would tell you, that show was no joke. That was that was, that was great. They did, a, they did a short tour. And then they came back. I saw them in Madison Square Garden, sent in third row center. That was in July. And Peter Gabriel came out for the encore. And uh, they did uh, I Know What I Like as the encore. And there was a great story attached with that, but then I'll, I'll drag this out too, too long. For me, the album, they're good songs, they're shorter, and they seem intentionally more simplistic in terms of the arrangements. Um, to my ears, a lot of it sounds like leftovers from Trick of the Tail and Wind and Weathering, uh, in terms of melodies and stuff. Genesis, Genesis songs tend to tell a story, and you, you, that kind of carries over onto this album. You know, songs like Ballad of Big, that's like a, you know, um, there's, there seems to be more of an emphasis on Tony Banks. And that's really, you know, that's highlighting the deficiency of having Rutherford on, on guitar. Uh, you know, what's looming over this album is the absence of Steve Hackett. And, you know, the question is, though, where would he have fit? So if you listen to tracks like Undertow, to me, snowbound, burning rope. I think he would have killed on it. Down and out, maybe not so much. You know, uh, it, it, it's uh, you know track by track. I think, I think there were a lot of lot of nuance that he would have brought to the album. A lot of intricacies that are Steve Hackett that I think would have elevated the material. Follow you, follow me is still a crappy song. It'll always be a crappy song. Um, but for me, it's a solid B. And if they had brought in a great guitarist to replace Hackett, I think it would have been a much higher, I would have given it a much higher grade. I mean, could you imagine Gary Moore playing on this album? You know? I don't know that it would have worked. <clears throat> I don't hear Gary Moore on this. Uh, yeah. But here's the other thing. Had Steve Hackett remained, then he would have contributed at least one or two songs maybe, which would have been made, made the album yeah. better. But you yeah, know, think about, but think you, his solo albums were. But like you guys are talking about Daryl Sturmer. To me, he was the for Genesis. He was the square peg in the round hole because he was a totally different kind of a player than Hackett. And you listen to his solos. I mean, listen to Daryl's a great player. Don't get me wrong. Playing with Jean Luc Ponty, you know, that's the that's the marriage. But you listen to his solo on Firth of Fifth, and it's like, huh? You know, I don't. You know. I mean, there's, there's the speed and, and, and the fluidity. It's all there. I mean, you know, the intelligence, it's all there. But to me, he's a radically different player than Hackett. And I don't, I never, I mean, I enjoyed seeing him live, but I never, he never, for me, he never tried to, to play any of Hackett's uh, solos. I mean, he just did his own thing. He brought his own thing to it. And uh, I never thought he was the right guitarist for the band. I would not necessarily, I don't know if I agree or disagree, but I will say that uh, uh, musically speaking, he's a much better guitarist than Mike Rutherford. Uh, without question, you know. So, so I mean, if you're going to give me a choice, I say, Mike, here's the bass. Daryl, here's the sixth string. You go. Oh, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. And the obvious thing was, you know what? What if they, you know, what if they would have done like a, like a Pink Floyd or something? bring in a bunch of ringers and bring in a bunch of guitar players to play on the album and then have Sturmer do the tour, you know, have a few different people come in. If you didn't, you know, if you don't want to commit to, to one person. So, uh, but they, they obviously made a decision that they wanted Rutherford or Rutherford wanted to be the guitarist. I think, you know, I think a lot of it is control. And I think that Banks, is you know he's a guy who wanted to control the band and i think that was maybe his decision that you know let's let's just keep it to the three of us and we'll we'll, we'll deal with we'll deal with the tour it's ken i know you mentioned um sounding like some leftovers or outtakes from those previous albums i think a lot of it sounds like a curious feeling okay not you know i think it's so like what you're saying about Tony, I think it, it's kind of Tony's record, maybe where. Well, isn't that where Undertow comes from? I think so. I mean, clearly, 
his imprint is all over the album, you know, and I think the fact, you know, the, the lameness of Rutherford on guitar kind of kind of emphasizes the point. So I think it's a very good album. You know, I, I went back and played it again, hadn't played it in a long time. You know, like I said, very nostalgic for me. I don't have a, you know, it, again, we're talking about transitions. It kind of goes back to that. I, I still, I call it a prog album, a Genesis prog album, just not as good a Genesis prog album as the ones that preceded it. That's all. Hey, Ken, can I interject quick? Because I, I think I remember you calling it weak tea. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, right? well, sir, yeah, I mean, and, I, and as I said, I, you know, compared to the other albums, it certainly is. But like I said, I, I've been listening to it. I mean, look, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this evaluation. So the rest of humanity doesn't have to. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I went back and I listened to the album, you know, again, a couple of times. And yeah, it, it's kind of aged okay for me. But, but there is a lightness to it, you know, tracks like follow you follow me i mean you know and then it's very ballad driven you know uh, but but good you know but good ballads and, and as i said as i listen to the album i'm hearing places where in my mind i could see hackett filling in and and doing something with the piece yep all right uh i'll give my two cents fairly quickly here so i do like this album and, but it's never been one of my favorites. I think it's a, it's a good sounding album. It's a very keyboard heavy album, nice melodies, some great songs. I mean, you know, Down and Out, Under Tow. I like Snowbound, uh, Deep in the Mother Load is absolutely terrific. Uh, Scenes from a Night's Dream, I think is a really fun little song. I'm not that big on the on some of the other ballads though. Um, and yeah, they're not terrible, they're okay. Ballad Big is kind of fun. But I, since the first time I heard this album, I really missed Hackett's guitar and I would have been okay with it. I think if Rutherford played a little more on it, but maybe he just, this is what he was capable of at the time. And I, you know, I also think it's really strange that you employ a guy like Daryl Sturmer tour after tour, after tour, after tour for forever. Right. And even, and I agree with Ken, it's like, he's a completely different kind of guitar player than Hackett. So He's more of a fusion guy. That's what he does. And so their styles are very different. So on the old stuff, he just does his own thing. But wouldn't it have been cool if you had Sturmer on all the studio albums to then add his flair to all these new songs that they're doing? Because just think about how like stuff on Duke and Abacab and Genesis would have sounded with some serious guitar oomph on some of those yeah, songs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So again, I mean, I know it's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about this one, but I would say for me, I, it's, it's a middle of the road album when I look at the entire catalog, but I think it's a little underrated because I think it does divide some of the fans. The old school Genesis fans are like, ah, this is kind of where they went off the rails and the newer Genesis fans, you know, the, the eighties and up, this is probably too proggy for them. Right. So it kind of it's in a weird spot. So I would say this is probably a little underrated by both camps, I think. So, uh, yeah. So let's put and then there were three to rest for now. And uh, we'll go back to Eric for Black Moon, the reunion album from Emerson, Lake and Palmer. I think with all four of these bands, my perspective, I never got to see them live in their heyday. So I went back bought all their albums, ELP, kind of the same thing. Now I saw Emerson, Lake and Powell. So, but the first time I saw Emerson, Lake and Palmer was for this tour. And uh, I saw them in Albany, I think summer of 92, August and Bonham opened. If you can believe that one. Yep. I saw that tour. Um, so for me, there was a lot of excitement with this. And I remember going out and buying Black Moon but I went through my collection and I can't find it. So I think I sold it. So that probably gives you my two cents on what I think of this. So um, I know we spent a lot of time on Genesis, but I did go back and listen to it. Um, Carl Palmer, I'm just surprised at how restrained he is, but I think the songs <clears throat> put him in that spot. There's no Carl Palmer on this record. 
Um, so he, to me, he's eliminated right out of the gate. Um, it's a lot of Greg Lake ballads and sappy songs. Um, I, I did take notes that I think Close to Home had some nice piano. Changing States might be the one song that kind of touches the old stuff a little bit, not, not enough to make it listenable. So I'm going to call it Bland Moon, and I think it sucks. Oh, the Eric of last week is back. Last week is back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chad, on to you. Uh, I hadn't listened to this album in uh, quite a long time. So when this assignment came up, this went on the other night. And um, I was texting with Ken. I said, yeah, I think I remember liking about a third of this album. And um, that helped true. Um, and like Eric said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that Greg Lake uh, ballad -y stuff going on here. His voice is a, it has dropped uh, since, since the heyday. So that's a little odd to get used to. Um, I'm sure that had a lot to do with the weight that he had gained. Um, you know, even, they, he even dragged Jeff Downs into this to, uh, to help write uh, Affairs of the Heart, which is, eh, it's not a great song. I mean, some of these sound like Greg Lake solos, solo spots and they just don't fit. Um, I do like Black Moon, the title track. I think their cover of Romeo and Juliet, the Prokofiev Prokof song is great. I think that's really good. Um, Changing States is an original, it's an, it's an Emerson original. Uh, like Eric said, it's good. It doesn't quite reach the heyday of some of the, um, or the, the, the flair of some of the big songs from their heyday, but it's still a nice instrumental uh, original. Um, I don't find much of the rest of the album uh, super listenable, not one, not one I go back to. Um, a lot of these ballads sort of sound the same after a while, um, you know, acoustic driven and just not too much going on. Um, so I don't want to say it sucks. It's certainly, I don't think it's underrated. I think it's rated probably right where it should be. Uh, so my only other choice is misunderstood. So these are, you know, three guys with a big history, a, a rough patch in the middle, getting back together, trying to do it again. Nah, doesn't live up to it. So uh, I guess I'll give it, I guess I'll give it misunderstood because I can't give it anything else. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Steven, your take on uh, Black Moon. I think it's probably cards on the table time here because I'm guessing I'm maybe the wrong guy for this assignment. Because realistically, some of works volume one, I can cope with. I mean, prior to that, it's amazing. It's ridiculous. It's genre bending. It's groundbreaking. After that, it's bland nonsense. It's what we get. And I don't need any of it. And none of it. I mean, when you've got a drummer like Carl Palmer and you sit him down and see, see what that guy Cozy did, that boom, da, boom, da, boom, da. Go just do that for the whole album. What is happening here? What is this all about? It's just absolutely ridiculous. And a band that were, you know, breaking down doors and doing crazy things and huge shows and not caring what happened, but making great music along the way sound twee and irrelevant here. This is absolutely awful. I mean, they're, they're trying to relive what's happened before. You know, what did we do? Well, we, you know, we did a ballad or two. We reworked some classical stuff. I mean, Romeo and Juliet is, a, is an album highlight, but you compare it to what they did before, it's, it's, it doesn't exist. It's just absolutely terrible. And realistically, I mean, there's things like, I mean, the keyboard saw that, that's at the end of Farewell to Arms. I, I mean, just it's just cringeworthy stuff. And it really sounds like a band who don't know whether to stick or twist. You know, are, are we going for hits? Are we a ballad band? Are we looking to go in the charts? Are we trying to be prog? Do we want to relive the glory days? Can we relive the glory days? I, I mean, is it better days? I mean, it sounds like something from Miami Vice. It's just 
ah, this is, this is a band that's gone all wrong, all wrong. And this isn't our worst album. Yeah. Are we so, glad that they came back within the hot seat? Yeah, absolutely. So to me, does it suck? It's utter pop. That's what it is. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a couple sucks here. All right, John. Uh, <laughs> so you didn't like it, Stephen? I guess. Well, I'm on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the fence. Yeah, I was. Um, you know, I wasn't actually overly familiar with this album. Um, I mean, I I'm, I know I have it somewhere in a box. Uh, <laughs> you know, you got to remember though at the time it was it was recorded. I mean, you know, what is it? Ten or what? 10, 14 years after Love Beach, maybe. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there is no epic. I mean, they have a, the obligatory solo piano piece. They have, you know, the classical adaptation. It's Romeo and Juliet. That's a good song. They got a bunch of ballads, and I kind of like ballads. So I actually don't mind Affairs of the Heart. Um, I did find it a little weird how uh, Lake's voice has gotten lower on this album. Um, is it, do I think it sucks? No, I don't think it sucks. Uh, but in, you know, 1992, what do you got on the radio? Which, I mean, I happen to like grunge, but you have Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and Nirvana. And so I don't know, was it practical for them? They really think it was a practical to make an epic song. You know, they probably, you know, they probably could have. I mean, I'm sure they could have, but, um, you know, they chose to do kind of a, you know, a hard rock. I don't even know if it's hard rock. Some of the songs rock. But uh, one thing that did bother me is Carl Palm Palmer's, it's really high in the mix. Like the drums really kind of overpower. Uh, and it's, you know, he, he, he could do a lot more for sure. But it, it seems it's just, I don't know, maybe the, just the production of it. Um, you know, it's okay. But would I play this when I have... Tarkas, etc. No, so it's an okay album. I'm not going to say it sucks because anytime Emerson's on an album, I, I I do like hearing Emerson. He's got some, you know, he plays pretty good on this album. So and it's, it's not like funny. the early '70s, but yeah. how how much can we expect? Yeah, John, it's funny you bring up uh, that there's no epic on here, and there's no epic on the dreadful in the hot seat. But in '98, uh, at least Emerson was involved. I'm not sure the full if it was all three of them, but a, a 25 minute track called Crossing the Rubicon was created. And that blows both of these albums out of the water 10 times over. It's very, very good. I wish it had seen the light of day. Keith, um, Keith Olsen talked them out of doing it. Is that right? Was all th were all three of them on the track? I don't know, but that's they, what they like, wanted I'd to do to it. That, and they had talked about it. And then, uh, yeah, Keith, Ol Keith Olsen was producing the album. He gave it the thumbs down. I don't so know that was intended to be on In the Hot Seat? I believe so. Wow. Yeah, it's an excellent track. It's a shame. Hmm. Yeah. All right, so it looks like John and uh, Chad are both going to kind of give it a misunderstood because they don't want to fully yeah. say it sucks. I totally get that. So, all right. Lewis. I don't have that record. And I don't have it for the simple reason that it blows dog. <laughs> and the reason I say it like that is because, look, you have Keith Emerson is one of my my idols, right? It's it's hard to describe the genius of that man and the potential his compositional skills has. I think Stephen said it best. The early records were not only groundbreaking but genre bending, right? It, this man was a it was like a tsunami of creativity and talent, and he got the right singer at the right time, and this powerhouse drummer and these guys caught lightning in a bottle and then they got too big they broke up and then they they thought that all they had to do was just get back together and they would happen again and no it didn't happen again at all all the things that made them unique are the things that all the experts and the producers are trying to strip away from the band starting from the keyboard sounds starting from all the palette that they created that they use so effectively, so uniquely, right? Um, I don't, you know, I know that people like their digital synthesizers and their Yamahas and their whatever, but, you know, 
you're if you're Keith Emerson, you invented a lot of those original sounds. They're yours, right? And, and I think it's very sad to see somebody become so lost that they move away from the their not only their best work but also the things that they their their language, their contribution to the language. I um I don't understand that why they would they would allow that record to come out with the name ELP. Because it doesn't really sound like ELP. It sounds like dad rock. Um, you know, they, they sound old and they weren't that old. They sound confused. They're, they're, they weren't kicking my ass and, 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 and blowing my mind with, with great ideas. I was like, what is this BS? I mean, I'm sorry, but that, that what, what is it that was that? Um, oh yeah, Farewell to Arms. My God, Farewell to that track. <laughs> and it just goes on and on. So I, I, I look. I know that Ken is already steaming because I, I don't. I don't know how you sleep in your car at night. I, I don't. I, <laughs> I, I don't. I have, to, I have to roll out into the sidewalk. But 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 the truth of the matter is that um, I mean, again, if you just listen to the record by itself as a as a capsule, right? There is talent there. These guys are great. They can put together. <clears throat> cohesive music right but if you if you also label it elp then you realize well there's a there's a problem here right it, it's just not and there are moments that i think would have been great had he not used those digital keyboards had they just allowed you know carl palmer to not only play drums more freely but not have them so compressed and so so boomy and so 90 sounding, this is not a metal band. You need the dynamics in the drums. That's how Carl Palmer shines. So he can be like a chipmunk. You need to let his drums breathe. And, and, and that's how this band functions, right? So I, I, I just, I, I don't know if, for me, it just sucks because it's, it's a crushing disappointment. I don't, I, I, I like it even less than Far, by a lot less than than and then there were three which i actually sort of like because that other record has the elements of all the things that i like this is like um a bunch of old guys who decided they wanted to try to sound like elp but they got lost along the way to the studio and they did some karaoke instead <laughs> i just don't like it i'm sorry and, and i know that people are going to hate me in the comments i don't care it's just my opinion <laughs> i don't like it I don't, and it's not as bad as in the hot seat. That's the tragedy. Because this is, and again, it's, it's, I never fully appreciated ELP completely until I was in a band and we had to play all their songs. And I got to study the, the scores and I got to, I studied all the keyboard parts that I don't play. And that was an incredible musical education. Seriously, I would recommend to anybody who likes really likes music and can read it, get a hold of the scores and read the scores and study them. The man was a genius, a, a, truly a genius. And I don't use that word lightly. And this is why this album to me is just so vexing. It's like, what are you doing? Like, what, what happened to you guys? They, they, somebody had to just let them be, you know? And, and I think it was put correctly. What, what are we? Are we doing hits? Are we, you know, are we AOR? Are we Prague? But I have these new toys. But you know, let's keep it low. It, it's schizophrenic. It's a hot mess. I don't. I don't. I don't. Not for me. All right. Okay, Ken. <laughs> well, <clears throat> for me, I, I would right up front. I would classify it as a misunderstood album. So uh, I, I think it was an attempt to capture some of the old magic, but package it in something that was radio friendly. Uh, you know, I, I think on, on that level it succeeded. You know, I think that was their aim. Uh, I, I don't think the band, I don't, I don't know, but I don't think that they thought that had they made brain salad surgery too, uh, that it would have gotten any attention. Not that I think that they could have even created brain salad surgery too right um to me it's it just doesn't have that complexity of course to me it's prog meets aor and on that level i think it it succeeds um you know i went through the tracks 
Black Moon. Emerson's using a mix of his old keyboards, a lot of Hammond organ. It's got a lot of new keyboard sounds. He plays some, actually some really good Hammond organ at the end of the tune. Lake is singing in a lower register, but I think he sounds very good. Palmer sucks. And I mean, and I don't know if that, I mean, clearly Carl could play like a demon, right? I mean, the guy could still play. So it was clearly, it was either the producer, Mark Mancina, this guy they brought in, or I don't know, maybe they were listening to Emerson Lake and Powell and they said, hey, Carl, you play like cozy. I, I don't know. But he's playing in a much more, he's playing like a metronome on the album. I mean, so the title song I liked, I thought it was a bit geriatric. I mean, they're older and, you know, Keith was dealing with his hands and, you know, but to me, it was identifiable as ELP. I thought for 1992, I thought it was a pretty okay song. Paper Blood, I liked. I thought it was a, a solid attempt at something radio friendly and it succeeded. It, it, to me, it was like touch and go. It got some airplay. Emerson playing some really good organ on it. Uh, Palmer blowing it. Uh, Affairs of the Heart, I thought it was an okay ballad. It was a leftover from that that Ride the Tiger project that he, he was doing with Jeff Downs. It was all right. Uh, Romeo and Juliet was ELP. You know, it was ELP doing Prokofiev. And I, I, if Palmer was Palmer, I mean, I think it would have really elevated it to the next level. I mean, you know, again, he's like, he's playing like a drum machine. And uh, he's playing like uh, Phil Collins' drum machine, you know. Farewell to Arms, that was kind of a wimpy ballad. Emerson plays a nice Moog solo at the end, but it doesn't really save it. And I wrote down, I said, where's Carl? I mean, he's, he's like missing on the track in the whole album. Changing States was a, left, was a carryover from Keith's solo album. Uh, and that was a very good instrumental. Palmer woke up a little bit, but he's not doing anything outrageous. Burning Bridges was a generic tune that was written by the producer, Mark Mancina. To me, it sounds like something that was written that like you would hear from, like at the end when they're scrolling the credits in a, in a movie, like a soundtrack piece. Um, you know, Emerson, again, he's playing with some fire like I think he is on the whole album. But Palmer, he's just sounding like a metronome, which is very formulaic AOR. Uh, Close to Home was a, a fine Emerson solo piano piece. Although if you listen, I think you could hear him hit a few clams in there. Uh, but I thought it was fine for what it was. Better Days. Emerson's playing some nice organ and clavinet. It's, it's ELP trying to do something contemporary by 92 standards. That was all right. Footprints in the so Snow was a, a sucky ballad that just shouldn't have ended the album. It was a bad way to end the album. So uh, just to go back to what I was saying, I th they weren't trying to make brain salad surgery. They were trying to make, an, you know, in 1992, they were trying to make something that was going to get some air of play. And I think in, in that respect, it captured some of the flavor of the 70s, some, and it, it, mostly from Keith, because Keith, again, he was going back to some of the analog keyboards. So you're hearing the Moog and you're hearing the Hammond organ, which was absent from works, right? And, you know, the unspeakable Love Beach. Uh, <coughs> for me, misunderstood. I, I appreciate it for what it is. Is it something I'm going to pull off the shelf? No. Do I think it sucks? I don't think it sucks. So, Ken, answer me this. You just said, will you ever listen to this again? Probably not, but but Eric. But doesn't that kind of Eric, mean it sucks? Eric, Eric, <laughs> I, have, <laughs> Eric I have about 14,000 albums I, in the other room. I get that, <laughs> but <laughs> there are things, you know, would you even, let's say you're in the mood for ELP, would you ever play this again? No, probably not. Okay. Probably not, but doesn't doesn't mean it's a bad album to me. I mean, you know, I mean, do we do you only keep albums that are, you know, I mean, oh, I've got plenty that I probably won't listen to again. I, I might classify them as. I have about three thousand. No exaggeration. I have about three thousand albums in the other room. I've never heard. I'm not exaggerating. I can't claim that. It. And you'd much rather hear them than listen to this. Again. Well, to me, I, you know, but it's the way I listen to music. I, I, to me, I like, I'm always looking to hear something new. Uh, you know, doesn't mean I don't pull something off the shelf and revisit it. I do that all also. Um, you know, uh, sadly, I had to listen to the final cut again. But, um, you know, but 
Yeah, I mean, it was sort of fun, like, listening to, and, and, and then there were three. I, I can't remember the last time I heard that album. You know, it's been years. So I, I go back to listen to other things. But a lot of these albums are in my DNA. Do I really need to hear Close to the Edge again? No. I, I know that I, in my sleep, I, I know Close to the Edge. The only reason why I would play Close to the Edge is if they came out with some super one-step vinyl pressing that I'd have to drop $200 on because somebody told me I would hear, you know, I would see God if I, if, if I, if I listened to it, you know? So, you know, I, I, I'm the way I listen to music is maybe different than the way other people I know. Look, I have customers, you know, I'm doing this a long time and I have customers. Uh, some of some, <clears throat> one of which has appeared on this show from time to time who have a very, very limited range of likes they like what they like and that's what they want to hear for me it's ever expanding and i always want to hear new things when i go back to listen to black moon it was not a chore for me to listen to it what i you know would i would i listen to it again it, you know it might take another 20 years if i'm still alive I get that. I get that. all right so for me with black moon so interestingly enough uh, when i was listening to eric talk about you know tell his story I bought this when it first came out back in whatever that was, 92, 93, 92, 92. And uh, about maybe two years ago when I did ranking the albums of ELP here on the channel, I was going to get all my albums out and to go re-listen to everything again. And I'm like, where's my Black Moon CD? And I'm like, I must have gotten rid of it, right? Because I hadn't listened to it in all those years. I remember, I remember kind of digging it, right? But obviously, sometime during the late 90s or the early 2000s, I was probably like, yeah, screw this, right? So, and then I realized I didn't have in the hot seat either. And you know how I like to be able to show everything I talk about. So I was like, oh, Jesus. So I went and I bought like cheap used copies of both of them. And let me, you know, let me, I mean, not to go off on a tangent, but, you know, in the hot seat, really the only thing that that album has going for it is that I stole the album title for the name of this damn show and I changed one name around, right? That's, that's, that's about the only good thing about in the hot seat. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a masterpiece next to that. But um, in getting ready for the show, I, I re-listened to this again a couple of days ago for the first time in a while. And I kind of agree with a lot of what has already been said. It's really lightweight. I do, you know, Black Moon and Paper Blood are great album openers. And I remember like back in the day thinking, wow, this is great. And they played uh, Paper Blood on the radio quite a bit. And then thinking that the rest of it just didn't even come close to living up to those first couple tracks. Although Romeo and Juliet is good. Uh, I agree. Carl Palmer is like MIA throughout this whole thing. I don't like Emerson's uh, keyboard sounds for the most part. And I, you know, it just by the time I got like halfway through this album the other day, I'm just kind of like, yeah, this is like just as bland and unmemorable as I remember it, other than like maybe three, maybe four songs. And I think when you kind of stack this up against the rest of the catalog, you know, this in the hot seat and love beach and maybe even works too, kind of stick out like a sore thumb next to the rest of it, which is like amazing and so great and so legendary and so influential. So, you know, I wouldn't say this is underrated. I wouldn't even say it's misunderstood. For me, it's like, you know, when you look at their whole catalog, this kind of sucks compared to the other stuff. So I'm gonna go with this kind of sucks. Uh, it's not as sucky as maybe another one that we're gonna talk about tonight for me. But um, I just, now that I listen to it to get ready for the show, I, I don't, what I, it's going to go back up on the shelf. I may never pull it out to listen to it again. Maybe in 20 years, maybe if there's another episode we're going to do a decade from now where we have to talk about this in some other context, I might re-listen to it. But if I'm going to reach for ELP, I'm not going to reach for this. <clears throat> so next, <laughs> Rock Island by Jeff Rotel. Eric, back to you. Well, I heard Lewis talk about Keith Emerson, and I want to say before I say anything about Jethro Tull or this album that I think Ian Anderson is a genius. Amazing songwriter. I have such, this is probably the band I've seen the most of any of my favorite prog bands live. I love Jethro Tull. 
And when Crest of a Knave came out, I was hooked again. I, I did not like Under Wraps. Um, Under Wraps came out when I was in high school, kind of dismissed it. I really like Crest of a Knave. And I know you get the Dire, Strait compa dire Straits comparison. I think the songs are really strong. Um, I saw the Rock Island tour. I saw the Catfish Rising tour. I've seen Ian Anderson a number of times. So this was a band that was in motion. They were happening. They were getting radio play. Um, you get your little gutter rhyme, sexual innuendo with Kiss and Willie. And I like that song. I like the riff. And I think it's a cool tune. I was surprised. I will say I haven't played this in a while. So when I was going back to listen to this, I was surprised at the amount of flute and guitar solos that were on it. Um, that being said, I don't think it's as strong as Crest of a Knave in terms of songwriting. I think there's some good songs on here. Um, I just don't think it's as memorable when I start thinking about, because again, this is where Crest of a Knave kind of reignited everything for me. I went right through, I bought everything. I bought Catfish Rising, Roots to Branches, which I love, um, right through Thick as a Brick 2, Ian Anderson solo stuff. If I'm a completist, it's, it's with this band. Um, Rock Island, I, I, this is a tough one to place for me because it's not, I don't dislike it. I don't love it. And I can't say it's misunderstood. It sounds like Tall. I just don't think it's a strong Tall album. Um, so <laughs> I didn't, maybe I didn't do my homework good enough. I don't know where to place this. This one stumped me because I'm not going to say it sucks because I like a number of songs on it. Um, I think it's catchy. I do think there's a there's some Rock Island has a great instrumental break in that middle. I like that song too. Um, another Christmas song. I don't know why they didn't save it for the Christmas album, but that's a it's a good tune. I, I like it, um, but I don't love anything on it. I don't and and I. Like I said, it's been a while since I listened to it. I listened to it a number of times for this. I can't, I can't put it in a sucks category, but I could see where could it be underrated? Because I can see where people would dig this a lot. I just don't. I just don't think the songwriting is as strong. I like listening to the instrumental breaks. Like I said, I, I think there's a lot of good flute solos. There's a lot of good Martin Barr on here, but the songs just don't do a hell of a lot for me for the most part. Um, so, so I'm going to get an F on this assignment, but I don't know where to put this. I honestly don't. I, I don't feel like it fits in any category. I don't misunderstand it because it's a tall record. It is what it is, but. Yeah, Eric, I don't, just, I don't think Eric, just wait. That. Eric, just wait. I'll tell you where to put it. Okay. I'm waiting for Ken then. Thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Chad. I know you're not a big Tull fan, so what no, you I, I'm the polar opposite of what uh, of the fandom that uh, that Eric just uh, discussed. Um, but I did listen to it. Um, so this was, this came out in '89. It does sound like a band that's trying to kind of get back on their feet, maybe trying things a little bit differently. I think that lends itself to being a little bit bland all the way through. Um, nothing really stuck with me. Um, however, one thing that did, that actually a couple of things struck me. One is that Martin Barr is playing his ass off in this album. A song after song, he's just ripping, which I did enjoy that. I, I like that. Um, but the songs don't have that, um, that folky aspect of the, the days of old. Um, now, yeah, this is a lot later on, uh, and I don't know their catalog as well as, as some of you guys, but... Um, while it does sound like tall, it doesn't sound like classic tall. It's a different tall. Um, I did like that the flute, that while there was still a lot of flute, you're always going to get a lot of flute on a Jeffrey Tall album. But I felt like the flute was more balanced with the amount of guitar riffs. And I appreciated that. Sometimes I get a little over, over fluted, if, that, if I can use that word. You know, it's just, it's just too much. Um, I'm personally not a huge fan of Ian Anderson's voice. I can only take so much of his, his pronunciations and his inflections. Um, so I don't really have much more to say other than, I can't say it sucks. I don't think I'm qualified to say this one sucks. Um, 
because I didn't hate it. There was stuff on there that was okay, but none of it was memorable. None of it stuck. Um, I, I will put it up there with, um, you know, I'm going to call it maybe, no, you know what? I have no idea. I don't know what to call it. I'm going to flat out say, I don't know what to call it. I am also going to wait for Ken because he's going to have a, he's going to have a good opinion on this. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not my thing. It continues to not be my thing. I did appreciate the guitar and flute balance. That's about all I can say about it. Okay, cool. Steven, I know Steven's got an opinion on this one. I'm, I'm just gonna wait for Ken. No, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just go to me and I'll just. <laughs> Ken. Um, it's an odd record, isn't it? Really? I mean, opening an album with Kissing Willie is, well, it's a statement of something. I'm not quite sure what, well, I know exactly what the statement is, but that's not really the point. But then you follow uh, follow that with uh, the Rattlesnake Trail. That's <laughs> brilliant. I absolutely love that song. It is going for the throat. It's full throttle. Really like that song. And I mean, I, I quite like Christ of the Nave, but I, I can happily admit that, that that is as much Dire Straits as it is Jethro Tull. <clears throat> This to me is maybe, this is the Jethro Straits album, because I think there's a lot of Tullisms. There's a non-word as well, there's lots of them now. They're not, they're not bolted on. I mean, you know who's writing these songs and you know who's recording these songs, but it does, to me, feel very much like a band that's kind of going, ah, I remember what we're good at. And it isn't necessarily what we're doing. So let's try to get back there. I mean, you go through the Tull catalogue and there's distinct eras. You know, there's two or three albums that are like, a, you know, they work together in a sound and they move through the catalogue like that and they've really always done that. So it's very difficult to see what Jethro Tull sound like. And at this stage, well, they did sound like this. This album isn't just like a, a one and done, a complete anomaly in the catalogue. So for me, do I know how I feel about this album? Yes, I do, because I quite like it. However, I can understand why it gets the hard time that it does, because in the same way that we've spoken, I think depending on, we all bring in a good way baggage to the music that we listen to. So, you know, some of us can hear what we want to hear, and, and then there were three. Some of us hear some of the things that we hope to hear, and, ELP, do you know? And I, I think with this album, you can hear what you want to hear on this album, but it's not necessarily done in the way that you wanted to hear it. <laughs> okay? So, yeah, complete contradiction, and I think we're all kind of ducking it down. This, to me, this album does not suck. I'll go out there and say this does not suck. And I don't think it's misunderstood because it knows exactly what it is and it's fitting into a time and a place and an era. But at the same time, I don't think it's underrated. So does it deserve the hard time it gets? It probably does because it's quite calculated in a way. So yeah, it probably deserves the hard time, but I don't think it sucks. Well, we're doing a great job of avoiding anything ultimate on this one, huh? All right, John, can you perhaps uh, add, um, shed some light here? Well, I you know, uh, Crest of the Nave was my entrance to Jethro Tull because I kind of late to the party in that regard at the time of its release in whatever, 87 or whatever it was. And I really liked that album. So, so that's kind of what, I mean, that was my, my first Tull album. And then I got into the back catalog, you know, and more in, into the, in, the, in the 90s. Um, this album I haven't played in a while. Um, the first thing that stood out for me is is um, um, the guitar work. On the album is really good. I think Bar really. I think there's more guitar on this album than Crest of the Nave. I think the keyboards aren't quite as cheesy as Crest of the Nave. Um, there are a lot. There's still a lot of keyboards on it. Um, it's a hard rock tall album. I mean, Kissing Willie and Rattlesnake Trail. I really like. Um, Years of Ten. It kind of harkens back to a little bit of folky kind of and and country. And they mix a little bit of hard rock in there as well. Heavy Water is a heavy tune. 
Uh, Rock Island is actually more a little proggier, little like I like those. They kind of have these bursts of heavy riffs going on. I like uh, another Christmas song. You know, I'm not sure it's it's okay. My favorite song is probably Strange Avenues. It's kind of moody and ethereal, a little bit atmospheric. I like that song. So overall, I think Anderson has some really good flute on it. Laura has some really good guitar work on it. Uh, and but it doesn't. I mean, it it it's more of a hard rock album. So you know, whether it's it's, it's certainly not. It doesn't suck for me. It's you know, and it's not misunderstood. Because as I said before, they knew exactly what they were doing with this album. Uh, but uh, so I don't know. I mean, I like the album. Is it as good as the 70s? No. So, but I like it for what it is. It's a good hard rock album. I'll let Ken, you know, where to place it. <laughs> what category? We'll, we'll see what happens. We're like all stumped with this. Well, huh? <laughs> a lot of pressure on you. Put, you guys are putting a lot of pressure on me. You're doing good, Ken. <clears throat> Lewis, what, what would you all say? Right. Um, I I agree with Eric. I think Ian Anderson is one of the greatest songwriters of his generation. I um, He continues to write great music, even today. I think that, if anything, the difference in the sounds of the albums reflect the importance of arrangement and the importance of the other musicians in the band, which is often very underplayed when somebody has the byline of author in a song, right? Um, when people compare anything by Jethro Tull to the golden era, I mean, you got to remember all those albums starting from, depending on who you ask, but I would say from Benefit all the way through to Stormwatch was a constant, it, it's a, it's, it's really an unparalleled run in rock of just sheer quality and, and, and talent and idea. You could say starting with stand up actually. So you could, I mean, like I said, it really it's depends on it. But these guys were, were just in a role like nobody from my perspective. So I, I have always loved and had immense respect for Jethro Tull. So in the context of that, I think that this record is a little bit misunderstood. I think that the, the sound is, they, they were very successful with Crest of a Nave, right? Maybe unexpectedly successful, I would think. So they... It's it, you can't really fault them. I guess in, the, in in a similar way to what ELP did with with Black Moon. I mean, they had Cozy, and that record did well. So they figured, let's let's do it again. But Cozy is not Carl, right? They were trying to replicate a little bit of that sound, which to me is like Tall meets Dire Straits meets ZZ Top in a way. It has that heavy guitar, that bluesy thing, but then the the Mark Knopfler kind of singing with a little bit of the Mark Knopfler kind of leading. This is, it's, it's kind of interesting what they did. And, um, and, and Ian Anderson is a guy who tends to paint pictures with his lyrics, I think. They really, they're, they're like little vignettes. Like, it's, like, it's like walking through an art museum. Each of his songs has that quality. And, and, and I think that People often overlook his lyrics. I think the lyrics in this album are, people always think, oh, Kissing Willie. Ooh, ooh. No, I mean, if you, if you actually listen to the whole thing and, and songs like Ears of Tin, Undressed to Kill, these are some pretty, pretty interesting lyrics. It's a, it's a record about people who are in various hopeless situations created and, and the rock island itself is a metaphor for that. Like there's no escape from this place where you're stuck, right? You, everybody who's on rock island, no matter what they do, they always wind up coming back to it, right? Um, e even the Whalers Do's, which is the song that I, I, I actually, in spite of a one thing that I hate, which are gang vocals, when they all go, no, when they say, hey, forgive me, I hate gang vocals, but in spite of that, I don't think it's an unsuccessful song. It, 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 it's also asking questions, right? The world is changing. And people who had earned a living a certain way for, for, for centuries are now social pariahs, right? So what about them, right? Ian Anderson is a very smart guy. He, he has, he's a businessman, he's run a farm, he's, he's done lots of things. So he has a He's not necessarily the most affable person, but but he he's a good guy, and he's not a, he's not a stupid man, right? So, 
I, I, I find that the record in general is quite good. I would say that stylistically, uh, as good as Rattlesnake Trail is, and it is a good song, can you imagine how much better it would have been if they had let Dwayne Perry play drums on it? I'm just saying. It's, it's, it, this is one of those things that irritates me, right? But it, it's, it's not a bad record. Uh, and, they, and, and because of the success of Crest of a Navy, you feel there's a better energy among them. You know, Ian Anderson calls out Martin by name for he takes solos in one or two spots on the record. The, the, it, it feels very organic. It's, it, it feels like a bunch of guys who are kind of surprised they're still having fun doing this. And I, I appreciate that when I listen to it. So I would say it's misunderstood. And I would add that I really like the record. I, I hadn't heard it in a long time, but when I bought it when it came out. And I saw the tour and I, I lived with that music and I just inhaled it like everything else, Jethro Tull. So the, the reacquaintance with the record didn't leave me disappointed. I, I liked it. I, 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 it, it. It has some of the sounds, some of that weird obsession with drum machines from under wraps. It, it has some of the style of, of Crest of an A, but also a little bit of the, the ideas and the you know, not the melodies, but the, the cadences of um, Brothered and the Beast. It, it, it's, it's like a little mixture of these things. And um, I happen to be quite popular at Brothered and the Beast. So I, I like it for what it is. And um, it is a, a record where Martin Bart gets to do a lot of playing. He gets to do a lot of song arranging. Dave Pegg plays great. Dwayne Perry plays great when he's allowed to play, you know. So I, I just I like the record. It's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a very solid. Um, it's I mean again you can call it a hard rock record or whatever, but it's a Jethro Tull album. It, it doesn't sound like the other stuff from 1989, right? It sounds like Jethro Tull with some of these other influences, right? So I like it. I, I it doesn't it doesn't bother me. Cool. All right. All right, I guess the hammer's going to come down now, right? Well, yeah, I, I don't, first of all, I don't want to insult it, you know, the intelligence of the community as it is, because I'm not the biggest Jethro Tull fan. I mean, I'm a band that I liked, but I was never super into them in the way I was, let's say Genesis and ELP and Yes and Crimson and those bands. Very, I'm very respectful of the band. Um, I kind of lost track of them after Heavy Horse, after Heavy Horses. I mean, I like Songs from the Wood, uh, Woods and uh, Heavy Horses. I thought that was like kind of a brilliant turn. And, but after that, I don't really, I, to me, it was just, I, I, I don't really know it well. So I actually had never heard this album. And now I can tell you I've heard it enough. So uh, I, listen, I listened to it about three or four times in, in the past week. It, to me, it, it starts out with this Kissing Willie song, which to me, I just labeled it Pirate Proc. Um, it, it wasn't really doing a hell of a lot for me. Um, by the third track, by was it Rattlesnake Trail? It was losing a lot of the Jethro Tull character. And to me, they couldn't decide if they wanted to be Jethro Tull or Dire Straits. Um, and, you know, and I got to tell you, Rock Island, it's, it's no love over gold. So... Um, it, you know, um, I thought Ian Anderson's vocals are very weak on the album. Um, the flute work was fine. The guitar was great. Keyboards were not as prominent as like what I remembered from the seventies. Um, to me, it was again, sort of going back to what I was saying about Black Moon. It, it was like, it was an attempt to do something that was a little more AOR. It's got more of a hard rock flavor, less of a prog thing going on. Um, I didn't. I, I didn't remember a lot of it after you know. I started to zone out on it after after those first like three four songs. I didn't think it was a very good record at all, um, and I would say it's not misunderstood because. I wasn't really getting it. And I just sort of went and I looked at reviews and the general consensus is people really hate this album. And, 
So I would say it's not misunderstood. I think, you know, I, th I think I'm in agreement with them. I, I didn't like it at all. I mean, I, yeah, I, I was, I, based on what I know of Jethro Tull, this was a real disappointment to me. Right. For the aficionado, like Eric, I mean, right. there's something to what you said. Like, just I just Google right now, just because I didn't even think to look at ratings. But I think um, all music gives it three and a half out of five. Classic oh, rock man. gives it eight out of ten. But then the Encyclopedia of Popular Music gives it two out of five. Go on, like you know, like yeah. So, so I mean, I haven't checked the ratings. I'm just saying yeah. that that's something very interesting because it, it's entirely possible that. Well, like, you know, if, you know, not that I, you know, to yeah. me it's a little spotty, but it, like you jump on like Prague archives and you look at the ratings, you know, you get a lot of, you get a lot of two out of fives, one out of fives. And yeah, it, it's, if I was going to reach for a Jethro Tull album, would I reach for this one? No, it's not very good. You, you guys are just, you just don't want to admit it. I'm going to change my, I'm going to say it is misunderstood because to say this, if this is a one out of five album, one star out of five is beyond me. I couldn't, I mean, just, just you know, Barr's guitar work on it is excellent and the flute is excellent. So, you know, and I think Anderson sounds okay. I mean, he's never had, you know, his voice is always, you know, hitter. It's like either you like it or you don't. And now it's, you know, but at this point, I don't think it was shot. Yeah, but John, he, he always had his, he was never a great singer, but he had no. character. His no, he, that character. Career, you listen yeah. to this. He's trying to. He literally is right. trying to sound like Mark Knopfler. <laughs> yeah, well, Chris of an age, I mean, I get that. I mean, it I appreciate that because his voice is is shot, and he suddenly yeah. he realizes this guy can't sing mm -hmm. at all, and he's he, he's he's making it big. I, I can I can copy that. You know, he's trying to find an identity for himself. Yeah. Uh, this is an excuse. He's not sounding as good as he did. This is a fact. And yeah. nowadays. I have seen Jethro Tull in concert 17 times and I haven't gone in the last few years simply because it, it, it hurts me at a bone marrow level to see Ian Anderson tippy toe trying to see if he can reach notes that we all know he can't. It hurts me because he's such a is, is a man for whom I have deep admiration and respect. So I, I don't want to put myself through that because I I fucking suffer. Right. But he had to figure out a way to continue, and his ego and, and and the mentality of people wouldn't just allow him to hire a singer, right? Which is what he ended up doing later when he did uh, Thick as a Brick Live. He got a singer, you know, and that was a great decision because if you hear him play around the Roots to Branches era, which by the way I think is a great record. Oh yeah, uh, his flute playing is so advanced and so much better than it ever was. So it would have just been so easy for him to either go instrumental, which would have been like a very ballsy move, or else just get a singer and focus on playing and doing the banter. It's interesting that he chose Dire Straits. I think it has to do with the fact he couldn't sing anymore. Seriously, this is my only possible explanation because Dire Straits and Jethro Tull are completely... <laughs> Except that the writing is not the same. I mean, well, that, they don't have it. They I mean, don't listen have to that record. That doesn't sound to me. It doesn't really sound like a Jethro Tull album. That's right, because they used to have two keyboard players, and they no longer have uh, David now D Palmer doing all the arranging. This is what I've always said to people: the the importance of arrangement is 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 so un underrated in general and misunderstood. And and I think that this is this is what you get, right? <clears throat> It's, it's not the 70s talk, for sure. Was, no. Stop making excuses. Admit it. The album blows. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, everybody brings up great points. I, I personally like Rock Island. I do. Um, most Tull fans don't like this album. And that's really what's important. You know, to the casual fan, you know, whatever. They're, they're going to like, you know, Aqualung and maybe a, you know, a couple of other classic albums and that's as far as they go. But for those who have followed the band for years and years, decades and decades and know all of their albums really well, this generally ranks fairly low in the catalog. And, I, you know, it's not one of their best. I don't think it's one of their worst it's probably somewhere in the middle to bottom quarter for me, 
but there's a lot to like on here for me personally. I think Kissing Willie is fun. And I, I think John mentioned that this is basically a hard rock album. That's basically what it is. This is not a prog album at all. Uh, Rattlesnake Trail is great. Ears of Tin is wonderful. <clears throat> Undressed to Kill is fun. I love the title track. I think the title track and uh, the Whalers Do's are probably the progiest kind of like epic type of thing that's going on here. Um, Big Riff and Mondo is exactly what it is. It's this big riffy hard rock song. Strange Avenues is cool. I like the Christmas song. Um, I think the problem here for a lot of people is that, and let's go back in time a little. I'm sure everybody remembers that Jethro Tull won a Grammy for best heavy metal record in 1989 for an album that they put out in 87, which was Crest of a Knave, which is not a heavy metal album. And it didn't even come out in the same year that they were nominating albums, right? So Metallica lost out to that album when it should have been up against this album, which it's almost like Tull was like, well, we won a Grammy for an album that wasn't heavy metal. Let's do a really heavy album. And I think that kind of, it's the whole thing is confusing. This album is kind of confusing. It's, it's not a great album. I don't think it's a terrible album. I think personally to tall fans, serious tall fans, I think it's either a little misunderstood or underrated. I don't think it sucks. I like it. It's not a great album, but I, there's enough on here that I like. Uh, I just think that um, that whole period in time left a little bit of bad taste in a lot of serious tall fans. So I think it's a little misunderstood, a little underrated, and I'm just going to leave it at that. So <laughs> You're saying they sold out. Uh, maybe they did. They sold their soul for rock and roll. Sold their soul for rock and roll. And then they came back with Catfish Rising and did a blues album. So whatever, you know. They were still too young to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I definitely think that Ian's voice by this time uh, was already starting to, to, to show lots of cracks. Although Lewis mentioned Roots to Branches before. And I think he sounds perfectly fine on that because he came up with material that suited his vocals better which this and, and um, um, the album that came before it, he's still trying to do the Ian Anderson of old, same type of material, and he can't sing that way anymore. So, I mean, I love Mark Knopfler, but let's face it, Mark Knopfler, a lot of the way he sings is kind of like this talking singing thing, right? He does it very well. Do we want to hear Ian do that? Well, maybe not, but it's, I guess it worked for a couple of years. Anyway, all right, so the final selection from today for today is the final cut from Pink Floyd. Back to Eric. What do you think? So Pink Floyd and Lewis, I'm going to go back to you. It's hard to not compare to the magic of something like Wish You Were Here, Dark Side of the Moon. It doesn't mean I want to hear that again. But I think when I was in high school, the wall was huge. You do what you did in high school. You're hanging out with your buds and you're listening to that record. And to me, that record has not held up very well. There's some absolutely amazing songs on it. But as a listen from start to finish, it's, it's a tough listen sometimes to get through that. And I think when I think about this and I think about my favorite Floyd, Wish You Were Here was a band firing on all cylinders, right? I mean, that's an absolutely beautiful record. You can hear all the contributions. I don't care who wrote the songs. Richard Wright's all over it. Gilmore is amazing as he usually is. And even when you get past that and you go to Animals, and Animals kind of brings in the anger that continues through Floyd and Roger Waters, I still love Animals. The final cut... Gilmore is, and this, you know, this is no mystery, is so sorely underutilized. And I know they've said it a million times, it's outtakes from the wall. And Gilmore did not like this, did not want to do it. Richard Wright wasn't a part of it. The only things I like on this are possible pass, and that's because of the guitar solo. Not now, John, because you get to hear Dave sing and some more guitar. I just, it's not, I listen to music because I want to enjoy it. I get, I don't enjoy this. It's not something I want to listen to. It's not something I want to reach for. I'm not going to play it by the pool. 
I'm not going to play it when I'm sitting home by myself because it's going to depress the hell out of me. I just don't get anything from this. I get no enjoyment or maybe two minutes of enjoyment because that's the extent of the three guitar solos Gilmore gets on the record. Uh, I don't want to hear Roger Waters bitching and it, that does go back to the wall a little bit. Um, sucks is where I'm going with this. I just, and I don't listen to this and Ken, I would sell this. I don't want it. I don't want to listen to it anymore. I don't want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I got my own problem. Excellent. Okay. So that's, uh, I don't know. It's, Again, I just think it's not a band anymore. It was Roger doing what Roger wanted to do. And there's no pleasure and enjoyment I get out of listening to that record. So I think it sucks. Fair enough. Fair enough. Chad. So uh, I got, I listened to, I should say, I first had the final cut because when I first got into Pink Floyd, I had to be sort of a completist. You know, I didn't go all the way back at that point in time to like, I'm a gum on and uh, and in that era, honestly, I still don't have those records because I don't think I have that much interest in all the noise making. But um, right after the wall, you have the final cut. So I bought the final cut. I think I remember hearing Not Now John on uh, WMMR in, the, in Philadelphia. Thought that was okay. Um, but looking now, now putting this whole thing in context, now I had the cassette. Let me say that first. I probably listened to it once, literally once. Um, I may have even just what fast forwarded the second side to hear Not Now John and never listened to the album. Like, I honestly don't remember. But looking back at their continuum now, kind of along the lines with what Eric was talking about, but I'm looking at like relatability. Like, Dark Side of the Moon was the, you know, it was, it was a smash. Um, Wish You Were Here has themes people can relate to. Uh, animals, even though it's very political, people can relate to those, possibly those views, right? Um, and I may say something a little blasphemous here. I don't think the wall's that great. Not even just dated. I don't think it's that great. I could take about a third of that album and be happy with it. Uh, I think there's a lot of filler. I think there's way too much Roger. It's his story. It's all of his 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 angst and his anger and uh, you know, the topics around the war and um, putting that together with what happened during the animals tour when he got spit on and literally and put up that emotional wall between him and the crowd. Um, it's just too focused on Roger Waters. Then you go one more album and you get the final cut. And there's already enough crap on the wall for me I don't need a full album that I know is going to is is leftover crap. What's worse than crap, but leftover crap? So I went back and listened to this. I've actually listened to this twice this week, and I fucking hate it. I hate this album. Um, it's all Roger either talking, whispering in your ear, or in the back of the room screaming lyrics and and complaining. And oh, what was me? Like his the only father that ever died in a war and calling out Maggie Thatcher and all that. I just want to tell him to shut the hell up. Um, I've never followed his solo career, probably because of this. This should not be a Pink Floyd album. It should not have that name. It doesn't have the, the feel that Pink, other Pink Floyd albums have because David Gilmore is not doing his thing besides a couple solos. There is no Richard Wright with the pastoral, pastoral uh, atmospheres and Luis, I know you like this album, and I know you hate Momentary Lapse of Reason, but Momentary Lapse of Reason has Dave and has Rick, and some of that feel does go with those albums, whether you like it or it not. Has, it has Rick in name only. Well, and true, true. It does sound like, uh, I don't like Momentary Lapse of Reason that much, but it does sound more like a Pink Floyd album. Yes. This sounds yes, like that's, that's, that's where I'm going. And really, this is this is Roger Waters' first solo album. And I was reading reviews of some things and someone said, this should have been called his first solo album. And one of these reviewers called it his best solo album. And for me, if someone calls this his best solo album, I really don't want to hear the pros and cons of hitchhiking and radio chaos and all his other nonsense. So two thumbs down, 
major suckage. All right. Stephen. I think this is the perfect album to end this on because this to me is the archetypal misunderstood album. And the reason for that is because it's one of the very few albums that I own that has the wrong band name on the front. <laughs> That's the issue here. The issue is that this is not a Pink Floyd album and it was never conceived as a Pink Floyd album. And most of Pink Floyd don't play on this album. This is a Roger Waters solo album. I'd go as far as to say it's his second, because the walls is first yeah. in many ways. Okay, that's maybe a step too far. But realistically, once you take Richard Wright out of the equation sound-wise and put David Gilmore in a cupboard, <coughs> just open that cupboard and close it again, every now and again to kind of say, is he, he is here, he is here, no, he's not. Then it can't really be a Pink Floyd album. However, I really like Roger Waters' solo stuff. So the difference for me is that I'll take this. I don't mind this at all. Is it depressing? Well, I mean, Roger Waters wrote it. Of course it is. <laughs> that's, that is, that's the trademark. That's what it's about. All the tropes are here now. All the things that he relies on and he uses are here. There's a really complicated story that's far too simplistic at exactly the same time. There's lots of, you know, tricks with sound. As you say, Chad, one minute he's, you know, and he's in your ear and he's, you know, you don't quite know what he's saying. And the next time he's giving you a line yeah. is, I really like that. I'm okay with that. I don't mind that at all. The dynamics uh, and if you like this stuff and it draws you in and then he shoves you away, I think that's half the fun. And yeah, I mean, as I say, no Richard Wright and it's Andy Bone who's been with status quo for 7,000 years, I think now, who's playing piano and Hammond and things. The whole sound is totally different. There's very little connect between what we had and now what we've got. So yeah, I mean, Roger Waters, he doesn't just dominate. This is his album. This is not a Pink Floyd album. For me personally, I would probably put this as his third best solo album. And I'll say that as a compliment. So that this to me, it's perfect to finish on this one. This is the archetypal misunderstood album. It's misunderstood by everybody other than Roger Waters because it's got the wrong band name on the front. And from that starting point, how can you understand what it's about other than with years and years of hindsight? And that's where we are now. So I really like this album. I understand why people hate it, but I really like it. Misunderstood for me and massively. That's, that's, Stephen, that, that's a record that you'll pull off the shelf and listen to. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. I, I fear for your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go on record. I don't care what what name is on that album cover. I can't stand the album. It doesn't matter. And that's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't like Roger's voice that much either. So it's that. Well, I, I think he's great on this. There you go. All right, John. Yeah, talk about a derisive album. Um, and yeah, like I agree with Stephen, it, this I I take this to be more of a, a Roger Waters solo album. I mean, you know, Wright was gone after the wall, uh, so you know, and the animosity, the vitriol between Gilmore and uh, Waters was at an all time high in this album. I think that you know, so, and yeah, I I agree that Gilmore. I mean, he isn't he's criminally underrated or used, uh, used um, just too little on this album. Um, when he does appear, I think it's excellent. But I, I actually really like this album. And this is an album that I've played right since, you know, it was released in 83. And I continue to pull this album out a lot. Um, and I think it really, I think it's really applicable. Uh, the theme in this album being, you know, um, uh, you know, Roger's dad dying in the war, um, you know, and what what have we learned from that? What did we what did we take from World War II? Like what happened? The post war dream. So all we got was a Cold War. We got Korean War. We got the Vietnam War. We got all these wars, Iran Iraq, um, Afghanistan War. So yeah, you might think of it as Roger bitching about stuff, but I mean he's got a point of view, and I don't I don't think this is like you know like a self-indulgent 
bitch fest. I think he's just writing really emotional lyrics. I love how he sings in this album and it's like typical Waters. Like sometimes you can hardly hear him. Sometimes he's screaming. I like that. It's really dramatic. Um, I mean, that's what he's, that's how he, I mean, he doesn't have a great technical voice, but I think he has a lot of conviction on this album. I can't stand the way he acted towards the band. Like he must have been a really nasty guy to, to um, work with. But I do think, you know, and the effects on this album are awesome. And Mason um, was in charge of sound effects on this mostly, I think. And they are really good on this album. So it's got those Pink Floyd tropes. Um, but it's not, I mean, you can't, I, I don't compare this to um, Dark Side of the Moon or Wish You Were Here or Animals or even The Wall, which I really like. One of my favorite albums of all time, actually. So maybe that's kind of why there are some similarities between this and the wall, being that they are, um, you know, predominantly uh, Waters creations. But, you know, I just, and I think there's a lot of good melodies on this album, which is another, you know, Post, Post War Dream has a great melody. Fletcher Memorial Home has a great melody. South, Southampton Dock is a really pretty song. Two Sons and the Sunset. I love the saxophone in that. It's, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, is it depressing? Probably. I mean, there's a nuclear war, but I think it's got a great melody. So, I mean, I disagree with the lack of melodies that I, you know, you hear that all the time. Water sounds really good on it. He was a dick uh, during this album, no doubt about it, but I think it's a hell of a good album. So that's my take. Misunderstood. And as, uh, and it, it probably is the wrong name on the album. So it be Roger Waters so um, I love how we've got such varying opinions on this album which I kind of thought it, was. and that's what this album does yeah I mean there really <laughs> is a you hate it or you like it yeah cool all right Lewis okay I'm gonna say a few things <laughs> first of all um uh, the, I would say and I agree with Stephen there completely but I also disagree with one point that he said and only one this is the ultimate in misunderstood albums, from my perspective, right? First of all, people who think it's a bitch fest have not paid attention to the lyrics. So that automatically disqualifies that opinion because it, you're talking about what you think it's about, not what it's actually about. Secondly, um, there is a perception that has affected a perception about Roger Waters that I think has affected the perception of the of this particular album, which is that he's a megalomaniac and a dick. Now, he is certainly, I have never met him personally, okay? But I have followed his career very closely because he is my ultimate hero in music. And I can say from, a, from my very, very, very lowly floating above the surface of the prog pond scum level, that one of the most frustrating things you can ever find yourself doing is being in a band where everybody feels that things are equal, but not everybody contributes equally. Let me repeat that. It's extremely frustrating to be in a band which is perceived as a band of brothers where everybody wants the same credit, but not everybody wants the same responsibility and the same level of creative input. During the wall, Richard Wright was strung out in drugs and was unable to perform. Um, David Gilmore himself did not bring a lot of ideas to the band. Let's not forget that between animals and the present, David Gilmore has only come up with a handful of albums, most of which have been co-written with a lot of people, including his wife. David Gilmour is my favorite guitarist, but he's a guy with a, a lot of nothing to say. So in the universe of Pink Floyd, I've always viewed it as David Gilmour is the heart and Roger Waters was the brain. And there was, they needed that. You've all said it. You like the light and dark of the other records, right? Wish You Were Here has that interplay between all three of them. And Richard Wright was a brilliant arranger and a brilliant composer. But when people say this is not a Pink Floyd record, what the fuck does it sound like to you? It's not ABBA. It's not the BG. <laughs> it's fucking Pink Floyd. Now, the thing is, it's not space rock Pink Floyd. 
It's not pretty Pink Floyd, but it has all the elements that you would expect in a Pink Floyd record. The lyrics are not that different if you actually pay attention. And this record is not about my father died in the war. This record is about why are people still dying in fucking wars? It's exactly. Why are we still doing this shit? Right. Can't suppose to our dream. Yeah. And, and, and I find that it is songs in this record, like the gunner's dream are there's a masterpiece. I can't think it's, it's, it's just a perfect song. So yeah, it's not going to cheer you the fuck up. No, it won't. It's not intended to. And, and that's the thing is part of what makes music great is that there's a wide range of, of, of things and we don't have to all like everything, but, um, if, if you come at it with that expectation, then naturally you're going to hate it. But I would say that, um, you know, if the band had already fallen apart due to the fact that people were not writing for, for Pink Floyd at all, right? It's not that, I mean, Roger Waters doesn't have the authority to deny people songs when he's not even the producer. David Gilmore is credited as the producer. Okay. So I think that there is a, a misconception about who was doing what, when, and why. And that has contributed to the perception of the album as the work of a megalomaniac. I don't think it's the work of a megalomaniac. I think it's the work of a guy who's frustrated that his bandmates are not bringing shit to the table, to be quite blunt. And, um, and I love the record. I love the, it, it is, it lacks as with other things that he did after, it lacks all the wealth of, of, of melody and, and warmth that both Richard Wright and um, David Gilmer brought. That was the magic. That was indeed. So I, I can accept that that sounds like Pink Floyd, but I can't accept that the momentary lapse of reason sounds more like Pink Floyd. It has spacey keyboards, but it has an army of writers and producers and people and it has everybody trying to, to, to copy the old Pink Floyd sound, but it's not really a band anymore. That's what Water said about that album. And, and, I, and I think it's a very aptly titled album, A Momentary Lapse of Reason. No shit. Yeah. So I, I would say it's misunderstood for a variety of reasons. And I would add my own personal opinion is that it's a great record. And I, I love it to death. I listen to it frequently, alone in the dark with headphones as it was intended. And I, I enjoy it immensely. I, I um, also as somebody who suffers from depression, it, it doesn't make me want to slit my wrists. It, it, to me, it is a plea for, can we please stop doing this to ourselves? And, and I think it's a very impassionate plea and he's really, he really stands by it. So I, um, I connect with it. I don't need it to be happy. I, as I've said before, this this program, um, happy music tends to make me miserable, and miserable music tends to to reach me. Right? That's just how I'm wired. I don't want. I don't want to be. I don't. I don't need cues. I don't want to be told. To me, it's like a laugh track. This is when you laugh because we, we we made a funny, <laughs> right? And and in reality, we forget we're listening to the laughter of the dead. All those recordings were done so many years ago, and we're listening to corpses laughing, right? It's a very strange phenomenon. I, I, I just find I, I love Roger Waters. I love his integrity. Um, I think he, he is misunderstood and therefore his work is misunderstood. Is this the first solo Roger Waters album? You could phrase it like that because he was really real for it, but it was produced by David Gilmore and it had enough of Gilmore. Um, that it, it still has that yin yang that for me is the sound that draws me in. It doesn't have the magic of Rick Wright, but Rick Wright was checked out. Rick Wright was no longer available. That's why he doesn't play more on the wall. He was checked out. It wasn't that he was fired because Roger Waters hated him. The dude had a heroin problem. And, and again, as somebody who doesn't have the millions of dollars and the pressures of a Pink Floyd, I can tell you that having a bandmate with a drug problem is an enormous pain in the ass. So I, I can relate in my own modest way. I think it's, I, I love this record and I, I, I don't think it needs defending because I think that it speaks for itself. And, and I understand, like Stephen said, 
why people don't like it. I understand why people will react negatively to it. I just think it, it has also suffered from very bad publicity. And now, whether we like it or not, that's an entirely different thing, right? But you have to listen to what's in front of you and not react to the fact that it's not wish you were here part two or you know metal part two or whatever, right? It's, it is what it is. And, and, and yes, there are some songs that were, that were part of the demos of the wall, but there are others that are fresh. Two Suns in the Sunset was not from the wall. Um, there's, there, there's many songs that are, you know, Paranoid Eyes is not from the wall. There, there's, it's, it's, it's its own thing with some leftover, as we discussed with Genesis, you know, some leftovers from previous records. Some other guy was writing Tony Banks about stuff. That's normal. That's just the life of musicians, right? But I, I love it. And I, I, for me, it's, it's an essential. If, if I was, if I had, this is why I shouldn't have a store, because if I had a record store like Ken, I would label this as a buy or die. And that would not that would not do me any favors financially. It certainly but, uh, Yeah, <laughs> I'll be I'll be none. But I but I love it. So Luis, I think I think that you're making some very broad assumptions about this record. Personally, I mean, you don't know. I mean, unless it's been documented, you don't know the the group politics of Pink Floyd. You know, in terms of there's there's a lot of politics in any band and in this particular band think of the level of where they are you know roger waters is the founder of the band david gilmore came in well he is he, he roger waters and sid barrett you know they were he was one of the founders david gilmore came in later on you know in, in terms of the hierarchy you know we don't really know but we know that roger waters had a very strong influence on the band in the case of you know, it shifted, the balance of power in that band shifted with the wall because Roger Waters came up with the concept of the wall based on the last show in Montreal in 1977, the Animals Tour, when, you know, having issues with the crowd and, it, and he envisioned a wall being built between the audience and the band. And that was the genesis of the wall. And obviously, incredibly successful and i think that that enhanced his his power within the band we don't really know about the final cut everything that went on i'm not saying you know you, you're saying that i mean we both know that you know we all know, we know gilmore's barely on the record right but uh but why is that why is why is gilmore barely on this record is because he checked out and why did he check out did he check out because he was busy doing his own shit or was it because it was really a Roger Waters solo album? And, 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 and it was called Pink Floyd because, you know, Walter Yetnikoff said, fuck that shit. I'm not putting out a Roger Waters album. I'm putting out a, a Pink Floyd album. And, you know, well, Gil and I don't Gilmore care if it's your last that, album. Hmm? Gilmore said that he, he just didn't like the songs. Yeah, he so, he you, know, publicly, but you know, I happen to really like the songs. But, but, that, yeah. but here's my point. But, the, 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 the stories I've read, I've read uh, Michael Kimmon's version of, of the events. I've read Roger Waters. I've read David Gilmore's. You know, the reality is, and, and Gilmore himself has admitted that he wasn't bringing material. So if you're in a band and there is pressure to release music and all you can do is say, I don't like these fucking songs, but you're not bringing new songs. And what are you saying? You're saying, go write some more. Well, you just justified no, really Roger, what, what I'm saying. It was really was a Roger Waters solo album, but because of political pressure, po not political, but pressure from the label, it was marketed as a Pink Floyd album. Yeah. Well, I mean, the same is true, true of Momentary Lapse, right? I, I'm not, the, you know, look, well, yeah, of course. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I mean, I was not a big fan of that album either. But as we said, to me, momentary, great. I mean, momentary lap, lapse of rhythm is bullshit because there's, you know, you got Tony Levin, all these people playing on it, writing it, you know, but it sounds more like a Pink Floyd album than the final chat, you know, the final, uh, the final cut. It, it I, I'm, look, I'm not denying. I know you love this album. Yeah. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying you're wrong. I mean, you are wrong, but you know. <laughs> I mean, look, we're, the thing is that's silly. I mean, you know, we're all saying the same thing about this record. It's just that three of you got it wrong. So four of us, four of us got it right. And 
you know, and majority rules. So, you know, that's just the way it is. I'm sorry. I'm stepping on you. You're, you're not finished. Go ahead. Finish your diatribe. Go ahead. No, no, no. All, I'm, all I said is this record is, is grotesquely misunderstood. I don't think that it is about what people think it's about because I've actually listened to it and I'm familiar with the lyrics. So people who haven't, they can have an opinion, but who gives a shit? Like it's, it's just, uh, you know, you need to be conversant with the facts. I think that um, whether you like the music or not, that's an entirely different thing. And that's a totally valid position, right? Because it doesn't have the, the light and darkness mixture of previous records, that's for sure. So if you, if you, if you miss that, you're not gonna like it. But I don't agree with the characterization that it is the product of a maniac. I do, I do think that um, you don't bring material to the table in whatever setting. It can be a, a minuscule band or a gigantic band. And of course, the more dollars are involved, the pressure is higher. It's difficult for the reason you stated yourself, it's difficult for you to expect to have a voice because the guy who is bringing the material is producing the money. Why is it okay for Steve Hackett to leave the band because he's not getting his material recorded by the band, right? Why is that okay? But Gilmore doesn't like the material, you know? I mean, it, to me, it's like, it's kind of the same story, really. Uh, I don't think so because Gilmore wasn't bringing material. Hackett had a lot of material that wasn't being used. Gilmore had nothing. And, and that's a big difference. He was writing with Pete Townsend and other people when he did. He put out a couple of good solo albums. Yeah. And then, you know, he did a lot of other ones, which frankly stated, and, as I, and I'm on the record as saying he's my favorite guitar player. But the, for example, on an island, whatever, an island or an island? On an island. Yeah, that record, the best thing I can say about it is that when my daughter was a baby and she was fussy, that put her to sleep. <laughs> Beautiful and, album. And, 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 and it, it is, it's, it's as simple as that. So I, I just think that neither one of them is as great as when they were together on their own, right? That, that, to me, that is also clear. I don't well, think anybody would, I don't think anyone would. I can agree with that. that. Yeah. But I will yeah. say that at that point in time, it's very possible that David Gilmore wasn't bringing material to Roger Waters, A, because he hated him, and B, he had a bout face in his back pocket. Why would you give your best material to that asshole if you don't like him? And the rating was probably on the wall for the band break. You know, Chad's yeah. wrong about a lot of things, but he might be he might be onto something. I mean, one, one point. <laughs> Maybe that's true. But we don't know. history shows that that he didn't have that much material. But we don't know why. Yeah, why? Well, 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 he's been out of Pink Floyd longer than he was in it. I mean, with Roger Waters. So the question is, what happened in the between? Where is that all that material that he had? Well, he's had a yes. He's only had a few solo albums, but he also has other interests. He doesn't have to put out albums all the time. That's my point. They, they had other interests. Neither of these guys is exceptional. Jason was racing cars or yeah. collecting cars. Right? There, there's many, there's many reasons why people drift apart. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. I don't think it's easy to have a villain in a story, but I don't think it's true. What I do think is true is that at that point in time, Waters had a consistent output of material that the other guys didn't. All right. But through, Lewis, could that be working reasons. the other way? Then they, everybody slowed down. Could that be working the other way where Roger wasn't? So even if Roger's, and I don't mean to drag this out, Roger might write the songs, but in the old days, oh, Dave, that's a good idea. Let's use maybe, you know, Gilmore seems like a guy to me that maybe he's not always inspired, but he's a contributor. And I mean, you know, Roger was kind of cutting them off, right? <laughs> I think we, we kind of forget like Animals is mostly a Roger Waters album, but with so much Gilmore participation, right. it really worked, right? Exactly. And, you know, the best songs on the wall are the ones that that, that Dave co-wrote. Right. They're also the oh. biggest songs on the album. The one Nullum, Run like Hell. Right. He, David Gilmore brought so much creativity to them. If you listen to something like Hey You, 
that is a song that sounds the sound of that song is a result of the fact that he restrung a guitar with just high strings so he could just play across the chords these open tunings and that's why they ring so so beautifully if you try to play a normal guitar it's just not going to work this is the magic of david gilmore right he's an arranger he's a guy that brings he's a great producer right he is, is not necessarily a writer i mean but, there's know, no disputing that, that there's a profound amount of creativity among yeah. those guys yeah you know and and given and given an unlimited budget from from the record label you know you could do whatever you want and you could dick around and 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 take years to make an album or not and go race cars or go live on a houseboat you know uh so i think at that point they they there was so much animosity between them that you know they could barely you know be in the same room together like during the final cut yeah so i mean maybe that's why gilmore they're Maybe still fighting. Kinda, he wasn't. He yeah. wasn't liking, liking his situation. He wasn't enjoying it. Yeah, but and if, he, if, if think, David Gilmore but, didn't didn't I, like Roger's songs, why would he want? To, and he that? didn't like him personally at the time. Why would he want to be that arranger to make those songs better if he thinks the songs are terrible in the first place? Well, I would argue this: if you listen to the songs and you compare them to the old ones, you'll find they're not that different. What does make a difference is that he's angry. And I give you a full credit on that. If the guy's angry, he's not going to want to work on them. Right. But it's not that he right. doesn't like the songs. He just doesn't like the guy who wrote them. He well, didn't have a problem with the songs before. Wait, well, so this well, for, 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 the well, dynamic maybe, is, is changing. Maybe that's true or maybe it isn't. But he's been on record saying he didn't like those songs on the that Roger brought to the final cut. I mean, guys, guys, there's a 5.1 mix of animals sitting in a can for years. That can't get released. Why? Because Gilmore <laughs> and Waters are fighting over the liner notes. Right. <laughs> it's like these guys don't, yeah. they don't like each other. Yeah, They'll they get just... together on stage for, for a charity event once every 10 years. They don't like each other. Not many people seem to like Roger Waters, except for Luis. But, you know, that's... You know. <laughs> I like Roger Waters. Well, all right, John, you know, but you're Canadian. You're, you're strange. Yeah, I like everybody. Canadians like everybody. Because the Canadians yeah. are too friendly. Like <laughs> just much too friendly. Probably. Yeah. Hey, Pete, what do you think of this album? Well, so Ken, Ken, Ken's got to give his. Uh... I'll, 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 I'll look. We're all saying the same thing. I mean, yeah, you know, Roger. You know, we know war is bad. Um, I think that there's a lot of misinformation about the album. I, 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 I read one one comment where somebody said that this was actually part of the wall and that the record label Columbia wouldn't let them release a, a triple album. And that's gotta be bullshit. Cause first of all, record label would let them release a triple album. They were Pink Floyd. They could do whatever the fuck they wanted. But besides that, I, I can't, I can't see where in terms of the storyline, the sto you know, the arc where this would have fit into the wall. I mean, I'm sure some of the music came from the wall, but I'm sure the lyrics got changed and, you know, um, it, it's a very maudlin album and it's a Roger Waters from my perspective. And I think we all kind of, most of us agree that it's really a Roger Waters solo album in disguise. Um, thematically, not lyrically, but thematically, uh, sonically, it sounds like a continuation of the wall. Uh, I, and I imagine some of it was recorded during those sessions. Gilmore's barely on it. He throws, you know, he throws some nice solos on there. But that's and that's about it. Um, it's a gr it, it's a, it, if you have a good sound system, it, it's pretty cool because uh, they used this guy Hugo Zuccarelli. He had this uh, this process called holophonics, which was a, an early uh, way to manufacture three D sounds from stereo speakers. Later on, Roger uh, used something called Q sound, which was a, a much better enhancement. On Amuse to Death. He was on Amuse to Death. And that's really great if you want to sit and turn the lights out and you want to hear a dog barking over your shoulder. That's kind of cool. But, you know, I, Amuse to Death to me was a shit record anyway. But it's a great album. Me, it's a great yeah, album. I, I it's like it's a fantastic album. Yeah, terrible. Terrible. <laughs> he, wasted Jeff, he wasted Jeff Beck on that album. So, you know, to me, Roger just should have upped his visits to the shrink instead of making us all suffer. I, I, I think it was just, <laughs> just, yeah, that. When he left Floyd, 
I didn't care. I just didn't care because, and I like the wall, you know, the wall was fine for what it was, you know, it was, it was a different version of Pink Floyd, but there was enough outstanding parts to it that overrode the parts of the story that I just, you know, to me, like the wall was a little too long, you know, kind of like when we were talking about the lamp might've been like a great three-sided album, um, could drag that a little bit, but the wall was for what it was, didn't really sound like a Pink Floyd, right? What I conceive, what I hear is a Pink Floyd album. Very good album, I think. Final cut thematically, he lost me. And it 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 just was like a it was to me, it was almost like at the time I thought of it as outtakes from the from uh, the wall. I don't like it. I think I think it's a shit sandwich. All right. That's so <laughs> My my final thoughts uh, on this album, and then we'll we'll let Stephen go to bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know the funny thing is, and we haven't really talked about it at all. And then I might kind of pose this question to Stephen because he is from the UK. You know, I have talked about this album many times here on Sea Tranquility, and I basically had the same thing to say about it every time. And I've been told by many folks from the UK that. You Pink Floyd fans in the U.S. don't understand this album. You could never understand this album because the lyrical themes in this album really only hit home for us, meaning folks from the U.K. So I was always like, OK, um, I can totally understand that. Right. So I, again, I, so, Stephen, I don't know if that is true or if, if I, I don't know. Right. Because I just know I read the lyrics to this. I listen to this album. And uh, like Eric, I don't get any enjoyment out of, it, out of this album at all. I want to love it because I love Pink Floyd. But my issue, I think, as most folks probably know, I'm not a huge fan of The Wall either. Because to me, that was, like Ken said, a little bit of a different Pink Floyd. I find that album, I like like maybe half of it a lot. And the other half of it just doesn't do anything for me. And I've always thought that this album was an extension of that. And but I like this even less. I mean, your possible pasts and not now, John and the fleet solo in the Fletcher Memorial Home. I like because that's got Gilmore and the rest of it. And I don't mind Roger's solo stuff. I like a bit of his solo stuff. But this is just not much going on here. It just doesn't grab me. So, again, I because I've heard it so much from folks from from the UK that, you know, I'm, I'm not meant to understand this album. But clearly, Lewis is not from the UK and he understands this album. John he is from he, Canada. He thinks he, he understands the album. <laughs> so I don't know how much that, you know, how much to like stock to put in that. Because I, I know other people from the States here who do like this album. I know a lot of people who hate this album. So I don't know. To me, it reaches you, it reaches you. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if the politics on not just this album but at least the first couple of solo albums are so UK centric because they are that it would stop people from enjoying them. Because I don't necessarily think that that's the sole reason that people who don't like these albums don't like these albums. I think there's more to it than that. Even just in the discussion that we've had here, a lot of people don't just like, like you know, the overall ethos of the album, the, how overbearing it can be how angry he is. Some people have been I mean, spoken about even like the vocal arrangements in various things. There's much more going on here than just the politics, but the politics are remarkably UK centric. Yes, absolutely they are. And as someone that was growing up at that time, I can relate to them in a way that somebody who didn't live in this country probably can't. Right. It's, but it's not, for, for me personally, it's, that's not the key that you stick in the door and unlock this album. Because I mean, Ken's saying how much he dislikes Amused to Death. I think that's a fantastic album. There's more going on here. You either connect with Roger's way of telling the stories musically, or you don't. And I don't think that there are many established artists who, I mean, we've discussed, well, say we, the group, the panel across two shows have discussed eight albums now, and we've agreed and we've disagreed. This is the most divisive one we've spoken about because you either are on board with this or you're not. And it really seems to be that way. You've got people here telling you that they love this album 
and you've got people here who are telling you that it's garbage, it's two thumbs down, it's a shit sandwich. We're all right. There's none of us that are wrong because you hear what you hear and you connect with what you connect. But Roger definitely seems to be at a stage where you either go, I adore this, or shut the door, I've gone. You know, you can keep playing. I'm miles away now. Yep. Yep. And I will say, I, I saved this one for last for a reason. <laughs> that was very calculated on my part. <laughs> it's funny because when I was introducing them all at the beginning of the episode, uh, you notice I, I mentioned that last and the CD happened to be on top of my pile. And then I looked down before we started and I went, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. Well, an absolutely epic episode uh, with some very, uh, well, yeah, we were divided quite a bit on a couple of these. So, but especially the last one. So for everybody watching, thanks for hanging in there with us. And uh, Stephen, thanks for staying up really, really late. My God, hopefully you don't have to get up early tomorrow morning. Uh, so everybody watching, let us know what you, how you feel about, and then there were three, Black Moon, Rock Island, and of course, the final cut. Uh, we are probably the, these eight albums we've talked about on this series the last two weeks. We were, we're probably going to leave these albums alone for quite a bit after these two weeks. I think. And I think everybody here is probably happy about that. So uh, we'll move on to other things. But I, I felt this was some pretty compelling uh, stuff to talk about, and I think we've enjoyed doing this. And uh, you know, we probably revisit some albums we haven't heard in a while. And you know, we can we can always talk about the 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 legendary great albums all the time. And we do a lot of that. Sometimes it's cool to look at some of these albums that are like these dark horses that sit in these catalogs that are so respected. And these albums that kind of like, you know, people are divided on. And as we've seen, we are divided on them as well. So uh, thanks for watching everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, all together, all the all damn the time day. for Eric Porter, Chad Hutchinson, Stephen Ree, John Newdorf, Ken Golden and Louis Nasser. I am P. Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you next week on In the Proxy. Bye-bye.